City of Salina, Kansas, host city to the 8th Annual State Convention of the National Farmers Organization of Kansas, morning and afternoon sessions held in Salina's Memorial Auditorium. Hello, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, U.S. Farm Report covers convention state level, as our cameras register the highlights of the Sunflower State Gathering. Later in our show, you'll hear from Kansas Governor Robert Docking and NFO National President Oren Lee Staley. But now let's move inside Memorial Auditorium to hear the call to order by State President Chris Walker. We welcome all of you to back to the convention. There are several new faces. We hope that uh, before the morning's over that we'll have all of our seats filled. As co-chairman of the Rules Committee, I would like to read the rules as submitted by the Rules Committee of the 1970 Kansas State NFO Convention. Number one, the revised Roberts Rules of Order shall be the guide on all matters growing out of this convention. Chairman may appoint parliamentarians. Number two, Night sessions of the convention may be held upon authorization by majority vote of the delegates present at any regular session. Among the preliminary committee reports was the report of the Rules Committee by Walt Farrar and Frank Rowley. They were followed by the Arrangements Committee and the Legislative Report. Once again, President Chris Walker takes the podium to make a special introduction. The introduction to the convention of NFO National Administrative Assistant Lloyd Fairbanks. Lloyd is a native Kansan. He was born and raised around a native Kansas. And uh, he's uh, a pretty shrewd boss. I worked for him for about eight years in the field staff department. And then uh, I have been closely associated with him or have gotten, uh, worked around him uh, for the last two years very closely. And it's my pleasure, and I'm real proud to have Lloyd to come down here to discuss some of the leg legislative matters with you. Uh, probably, if uh, time permits, when uh, Lloyd has made uh, a presentation about the farm program and whatever else he wants to talk about, you might have some questions pertaining to legislation. This time, I'd like to present Lloyd Fairbanks. Lloyd is the executive. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lloyd is the uh, executive assistant to the president, and I'm sorry that I overlooked this. Lloyd. Thank you, Chris. Directors of Kansas, officers, fellow NFO members, and I should be able to say Kansas because I spent the most of my life here in Kansas and I've been spending quite a bit of my time in Kansas the last couple of weeks and I'm going to be around with you a little while longer. I don't know how many of you have kept up with the Farm Bill this year. Uh, many of you have read your papers, I'm sure. But if you're like me and reading the papers, you cannot tell exactly what's going on as far as farm legislation. Now, knowing that this is going to be a difficult legislative year for agriculture, the different farm organizations got together in a coalition. 
which NFO was a part of. All the farm organizations, commodity groups, and many others got together, a total of 32 of them, not the farm bureaus, they did not join with us in this respect. They have never been for favorable legislation for agriculture. They want to do away with uh, legislation for agriculture, turn farmers out to compete in the trade at the mercy of the grain trade and to compete with uh, these other segments of the economy which have been protected by our government in various ways. The coalition group got together, basically five organizations, got together and wrote a bill. This bill was written on the basis of the 1965 Ag Act, which is a good bill, providing that it had been administered right by our past secretary or even the present secretary. But there was provisions in there that let the secretary, by administration, keep us at uh, only a survival level or maybe even slightly below a survival level. So the coalition got together, made it stronger language in a lot of cases, improved it in others so that there was, this would be a survival basis for farmers over the coming years that the bill would be voted in. We thought, as NFO, as well as the other farm groups, that it should be a permanent bill. And by having a permanent bill, then you can amend it better. But by just having a bill that comes up every year, two, three, or four, then uh, the legislature does not want to amend a bill like that, particularly for the betterment of agriculture in most cases. But as time went on, the Agriculture Department met with the House Ag Committee every Monday night for months on end, nobody wanting to take credit for any type of a bill that was being offered or any versions of it, particularly at that time the administration. But as things went on, it got time closer to the time that uh, the House Ag Committee was going to have to come out with some type of a version of a bill to be offered to the House and then considered by the Senate. Now then, as this got closer to this, it became more and more evident that the administration, every time that anything was offered that would be an improvement to the farm legislation, that they would draw back. Uh, knowing that the administration is dedicated, not only this administration, but the past administration, is dedicated to getting rid of farmers instead of helping them. And this is something that your vice president, Erhard Pinkston, uh, Chuck Walters, who has a master's degree in economics and also uh, one of our Jack Grimmer out in California, who visited uh, Dr. Huthaker, who is the uh, ag economist there on the uh, uh, advisor, ag advisor for the president. Uh, he pointed out very definite that this has been the plan, that they have been following the CED plan, that they, he said we had too many human resources in agriculture, we had to get rid of them. He said it was going to be very painful for many, but this is something that had to be done for the good of the nation. You have to be replaced, or not replaced, but shifted from agriculture into industry in the next two years to the tune of every sixth one of you in this room. You can start counting off and count up to six, and that person or somebody is going to have to take his place in leaving agriculture in the next two years. So they could not let a decent farm program get through the House Ag Committee or the Senate or the total Congress uh, if they were going to make this plan effective in that period of time.
but in my opinion is any improvement that you can make today through the Senate will do nothing more than the simple statement that I've made before, that this is a rotten bill, it's like a rotten egg, and basically all the Senate can do is take some of the smell out of it because it's always going to maintain below the survival level for you and I. So action's got to be taken this year. Action is being taken. Many of these congressmen that have voted against good farm legislation have to be taught a lesson. And even though there's only basically four of them that uh, have to be challenged to the ex real extreme, if you can shake these four, you'll shake the boots of the other 431 in Congress and the 100 senators because they know that NFO has the power to do this any place across the nation they want to. So action must be taken. You must be thinking, not of the man, not of the, par not of the party, in any way, shape, or form. As I told you, it wouldn't make any difference which administration's in there. They're all following the CED program. But the thing about it is, we've got to have congressmen and senators in there with guts enough that they don't have to worry about campaign money from the party and some others, and guts enough to stand up what is decent and right out here for people in the United States and go against the administration if it needs that in order to do so. I thank you. There followed adjournment for lunch. Then the afternoon session was called to order to hear reports from the Resolutions Committee and the Credentials Committee, to hear a guest speaker, and to elect board members. As the afternoon session continued inside Salinas Memorial Auditorium, we moved our U.S. Farm Report cameras to the front lawn of the building. In a pleasant and warm outdoor setting, we had the pleasure of interviewing some of the Kansas State leaders of NFO. Jack Kuntz of Crawford County, Kansas, is here in attendance at the Kansas State Convention of NFO. Jack, Crawford County's down in the southeast corner. You border a couple or three states, don't you? Well, we border one state and one county from the other, which is Oklahoma. We border Missouri. How big a farm do you have down there? Well, I'm controlling about 1,800 acres. Now, what are you doing with this acreage, Jack? Livestock, uh, run cow herd, and uh, also buy steers and pasture. You have, uh, you have these uh, cows on, uh, or the, the beef cattle on pasture? Yes. And right. they, are you fattening them? Uh, no. I usually fatten a few uh -huh. every year because I want to fatten one for myself <laughs> and then put some extras in with them. Yeah. What uh, about crops? Are you growing some crops? I've got about 65 acres of soybeans and 26 acres of corn. Well, now, how long have you been a member of NFO? Since 1960 in February. Is that the uh, year that uh, Crawford County was chartered? Right. And you're a charter member then? Yes, sir. Well, I mean, you're a diversified farmer. You've been at it, I'm sure, for many years. But what do you feel NFO has accomplished for you and the other farmers of your area? Well, uh, I guess we can't put our finger on it, maybe, but we could put it this way. If it wasn't for the NFO, in my opinion, we would be uh, getting a dollar and a half for our soybeans. And I imagine we'd be getting 10 or $12 for hogs. And I'm almost sure in my own mind that we'd have took $20 for our feeder cattle this fall, mm -hmm. which has held up pretty good. I got from 30 to 31 50 for mine off of the grass. I sold them in August. Uh -huh. We're talking now realistically about $3 soybeans, aren't That's we? That's right. Frank Rowley is a farmer. He farms 1,000 acres north of Valley Center, Kansas. He works for NFO as assistant grain director in the Wichita marketing area. Frank, one of the things that's becoming apparent, I'm sure, in the selling of grain is that wheat is wheat is a falsehood. There's a great difference, isn't there? Right. We have to get our members and producers more oriented into feeling that they are producing a product instead of a commodity. Uh, actually, when you take the elevator price or the old marketing system that our producers have been using for years, uh, that is a blend price because mm -hmm. we have quite a variance in proteins and in grades and 
the man at the elevator buying this wheat has to take all these factors into consideration when he prices, uh, his puts his buying price to the farmer, plus the fact that he has an inherent uh, profit that he wants to obtain for himself. Looks to me like the present system is the great leveler. It pulls up the, the poor wheat producer by his bootstraps to a level with the good wheat producer who uh, is pulled down in terms of price because of this blend. Well, uh, to an extent that's right, Bill, but actually it's kind of like, uh, as you've heard Orrin Lee state many times, a low-priced area pulls down a high-priced right, area. Right. And it's the same way in uh, the various commodities, a low-quality product pulls down a higher quality product uh -huh. in relation to that price. What is the uh, wheat outlook in the state of Kansas this year? Well, uh, basically across the state, uh, we had a real good crop last year mm -hmm. in total number of bushels. And in terms of uh, your ability to sell and in terms of price, how's it going? Uh, we do have a 25 to 30 cent better price advantage over a year ago, along with this added production, which is a good indication that bargaining efforts and the very fact that we're rechanneling this production has had an effect on the industry. Mm -hmm. Frank, what about membership and attitude in general? Well, as you know, Bill, it's a little hard to evaluate our, our overall membership increase due to the fact that we are losing farmers so fast. Yes, we are. Uh, basically, if we can maintain the same membership and develop these people into further cooperating with the NFO effort, we're making a tremendous gain. In my own county, I'm the county chairman, and I know in the past year we've lost some members due to the fact that they ha are no longer farming. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel we are, we are gaining overall in our membership in NFO. Frank, I want to thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you today, and I hope you enjoy the Kansas State Convention of NFO here at Salina. Thank you, Bill. Willis Kiesling is Reno County Chairman and 4th District Vice President of NFO. Willis has worked with the field staff department of NFO. He's been an NFO zone supervisor. Willis at the present time is farming 1,000 acres, 27 miles west of Hutchinson, Kansas in Reno County. Willis, it's a pleasure to see you today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, what are you growing on your acreage? Uh, I'm highly diversified. I am a wheat farmer, a milo farmer, alfalfa. I feed out hogs. I run uh, beef cows, registered Angus cows, and feed uh, steers or wintering and summering program on feeder steers. I would presume, really, that what happens to a farm of your type is dependent almost entirely upon the kind of prices the farmers receive for their commodities. It is definitely so. Without a price, we have nothing to continue with. The commodities that I mentioned, every one carries a pretty good operating capital to operate them. Wheat, better than $20 an acre, Milo, approximately that, and then hogs and cattle, varying degrees to the prices of your grain and your supplements. And your labor, we've got that down mechanized to where two people, my wife and I, or some help with my elderly father, we run this operation without hiring only maybe a few days' labor during the year. Boy, I have to believe that the independent farmer, like you, personifies farming efficiency. I think this is where the real efficiency in farming is, don't you? I feel that the efficiency, the ideas that has gone into the machinery has come from the progressive individual farmer. It's not the corporate structure that has made the advancement in technology of agriculture. It's the necessity of the individual to try to stay on the farm himself, his own ingenuity, to do this job. The business of the convention over, delegates and their wives made the short trip from Memorial Auditorium to Salinas 4-H building to attend a banquet where they could relax and unwind after an arduous day. Dinner was served to a hungry and appreciative group who were anticipating the double barrel climax to the 8th anniversary convention. Addresses by the Honorable Robert Docking, Governor of the State of Kansas, and Orrin Lee Staley, National President of NFO.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to meet and to share part of this evening with you. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to, a little later, once again, welcome Warren Lee Staley back to Kansas. He honors our state uh, every year with his presence, and we'll be so delighted to see him back in Kansas again. As Chris mentioned, this is the fifth uh, consecutive NFO convention that I've had the opportunity to attend, and I do appreciate your invitation, and I know that you share with me the concern for the future of agriculture in our state of Kansas. Two important issues, in my opinion, for farmers are corporate farming and collective bargaining power. I am totally and have been totally opposed to corporate farming in Kansas. I mean... <laughs> I made this very clear more than three years ago when I threatened to veto a corporate farming bill sponsored by leaders in the legislature. The threat worked. The bill died in the legislature. My opponent, who was a member of the state senate that year, 1967, voted in favor of the corporate farming bill. And I might add, I know where I have been and I think where I'm going on this issue. I will, <clears throat> and I will continue as this administration will continue to support the precept of free and unfettered collective bargaining between employers and employees and between farmers and processors. I strongly support both the principle and the practice of collective, collective bargaining power for farmers, for this is one of the few ways farmers can deal effectively in the marketplace under current marketing conditions. Uh, it's been a real great honor to be invited to attend your convention once again. I am looking forward to Mr. Staley's visit, and I wish you wisdom and enjoyment in this convention and in those of the years to come. Thank you very much. the opportunity to visit with you for a while because I think that we certainly are meeting at times where critical decisions have to be made by people in rural America. Critical decisions that not only affect farmers but the rural business people and in turn our nation. And I think the responsibility that we have on these so many fronts are so much greater today than they ever were before because the stakes now are so high. And these issues that seem to me to be paramount in what happens in rural America are not much different than what we used to talk about that we could see the trend was going to be. But the difference is that now that the NFO is a nationwide organization, that we have tremendous responsibilities as an organization, 
responsibilities far greater than many of us ever anticipated, and responsibilities that carry with us the leadership ability of every one of our county leaders, district, state, and national leaders. Not long ago, there was a new member that joined the NFO that I think probably coined a phrase or a thought that probably sometimes we forget about. And he said, you know what's wrong with the NFO? He said, you know you don't act like a winner. And I, I got to thinking about this as it reported, as you have something reported to you, and I don't even know who it was or what state he was from. And I got to thinking about it. And there's a lot of truth to it. In fact, I think it's the whole core of some of the things that we have to think about and what progress we have made. But with progress goes the responsibility. Now, what really could he be saying? First, for the first time in the history of this nation, we have a nationwide coordinated bargaining structure that's either operating or capable of operating in all 48 states of this continental United States. The first time that there's been coordinated economic power that has been brought together to compete with the economic power of nationwide buyers. And whether we like it or not, we're living in a period of history when those that organize and those that develop economic strength have the ability to compete. But those that remain unorganized get weaker and weaker in today's economy. And it's sort of immaterial whether we like it or whether we don't. We just happen to be living in the year of 1970. We're not living in the year of 1950 or 1960 or 1930. But we are living in the year of 1970 and we have to live with the problems that are in that year. You have the opportunity. You have the ability. And so all I can say is if I've done anything at all, I try to urge you for action in your own behalf and for your own welfare. Thank you. This has been Convention State Level. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at the same time on this station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.